Hey there everybody and welcome to the channel. As always, thanks for stopping by and hanging out for a few. My name is Rich Charpentier, I'm the channel host, and normally we're talking about drones here, building our drone business, doing drone construction progression reporting, doing 360 aerial tours with drones. We do a little bit of everything in the drone universe and we do it for paying clients. So for those of you who are new to building your drone business, maybe you're just starting out, maybe you're getting a new drone over the holiday season, you probably have a lot of questions. So there's a lot of sites out there to tell you how to pilot your drones, how to smoothly use the sticks, how to get those cinematic flights, other, other channels showing you how far away your drone can fly, you know, just the basics of what we can do with our drones. But what a lot of people miss out on is, okay, so we've got the drone, we're, we're really good drone operators, we fly really smooth, what do we do with this next? Well, that's where this YouTube channel comes in and also some of my online courses as well for building your own drone business. But today, I wanted to start out to our third installment of a simple drone job. So I know that more and more new people are coming to this channel and I appreciate all of you coming along with us. And I wanna give you some useful information so that you have it in the back of your minds as you're starting to build your drone business, what kind of equipment and what kind of software and hardware you're gonna to need to get these things done. So in part three here, we've returned from our client location. In part two, we'll talk about some of what we captured, some of the things that went wrong while we were on the site, and some of the things that crop up when you're on the site. But so here in part three, we're back in the office and we've got all of our data to offload. Now, this was a very simple project, a raw land site. So we're just showcasing three parcels of the land that come in at about 100 acres. So that's a very sizable property, and you're not gonna capture it all in one go from wherever you're flying with your drone. So the realtors we were working with wanted to do a video, and they wanted to do some still images. So we did, in fact, fly several batteries worth of video, still images, and also some 360 images for a 360 aerial tour of the property as well. So coming back to the office, you can see right here, not much going on on my screen. I have opened up the, uh, the solid state drive here for, um, for our media. So number one, what did we capture? Well, apparently we've got 50 items in here and a bunch of them are mp4s so they're much larger and then we've got a bunch of still images standard still images as well as a couple of images that were set up to be 360 images as well now let's find out in this folder let's get some information here so coming back from a multi-hour job we have 10.82 gigs of storage used in our media folder so that includes the standard JPEGs and the video. And in, in the Panorama folder, since we use DJI's Go 4 app to create our Panorama, let's find out how much we have there. 6.46 gigs. So we are looking at nearly 20 gigs of data collected in just a couple hours. That data is, of course, in video format or still format. So once we get back to the office, I grabbed both of these items and I brought them into my client folder here and so we're just hopping right in so i actually moved everything over and you'll see in the client folder for constructing their final video um i have some extra things that were not on my uh on my drone storage so i'm going to just close that drone storage there real quick but we moved everything over into one centralized location so that we could track it and utilize it and have everything in one place and you'll notice we also have another folder called M50 Kirkland because we were using a Canon M50 while we were out as well. And we also had a GoPro out there with us. So in addition to the drone, what else came along with us? A Canon M50 with a wide angle lens and a GoPro, I think it's the Hero 5. I was looking behind myself to see if I left it there. So we have all this information and the biggest thing that we wanted to do, the clients wanted to do was generate a video of the property for the property sale. So once we got everything onto our client drive, I pulled up an application called Kino. Now I use Kino for media management specifically 
for video management. You can also manage image, images and audio. So it's a great location when you're doing video projects. You want everything in one centralized location and you want to be able to preview it quickly. So we imported all of the original video files and then I want you to take note here over on the right hand side, we have a new video called Ground Turn North. What's going on with this? Well, we captured some really big video files while we were out on location and we're not gonna use all of what we captured. So if we've got a half an hour worth of actual video to scrub through and we're only making maybe a three or four minute long video, there's gonna be a lot of stuff that we don't use and that we don't need and we don't need to bring into our video editing program. So Kino allows me an upfront workspace where I can go through, scrub through these clips. Let's just open one of these up and I'm just gonna scrub through this clip really quickly. And then you can see maybe I, you know, where I want to start and stop this. You can also see on the Kino video bar that we've got this gray bar and then I have a blue bar and a gray bar again. That blue bar is an area that I selected that was worthwhile and could be used in our video production. So I actually noted the start area and went to the stop area. And then one of the great options here in Kino is that you can create subclips. So now I'm looking down here and you'll see my mouse here, export subclips. So you can create a subclip and you can do it in different formats. I did this one H.264, 1920 by 1080. And once we export a subclip, we have much more manageable items. So the things that have labels here, ground turn north, north to east, east to west, east to west, um, just some labels for my own reference. These are all subclips. So instead of dragging these giant multi gigabyte clips, into my video application. First I go through and I prep these in Kino. That way it's much easier on me to manage each of the clips when I'm putting them into the finalized video. So that's where Kino comes in. So there's another expense right there. And I think maybe Kino is running 179 at the moment. I'm not quite sure off the top of my head and I'm not even gonna look up the price. So you can actually check out Kino after you're done with this video. And I'd say take a read through, but this has been a really fantastic application for my video management for all of our different clients. So after we get all this in and I created all of my sub clips, what's my next step in the video creation? Well, my next step in the video creation, in my case, is Final Cut Pro. So once we've got all of our video prepped in Kino, we've got all of our sub clips ready to go and we're starting to be ready to assemble things, we can actually go over, since I'm a Mac user, I have Final Cut Pro. Um, for those of you who are not using Final Cut Pro, if you're a Windows person, maybe you're using Adobe Premiere or DaVinci, these all work very similar. You know, we're not doing a class on how to use uh, Final Cut here, but I did wanna let you know what's this extra piece of software that I'm using. I think Final Cut, when I purchased the license for it, was around $300. And um, so that's been a long-term license that I haven't had to renew. So that's been fantastic. And over on the left-hand side, I do have some of the events and projects that I've worked on. So I'm just clicking back over because we actually went through a couple of iterations of this video with the clients. As we did an initial layout of the video for them, um, we sent them a draft so that they could take a look and then we could start talking from that draft point about how we want the final layout, what types of labeling we want. You get the idea. So a fair amount of post-processing went into this part and the video when we were still doing the draft came in at over four minutes. As we shaved things down with the clients, we got it down to three minutes and 43 seconds and then the final version we shortened it even a little more because you don't want to bore the viewers. And I know my videos go on longer here, but they're mostly tutorials. So we spend a little more time talking about things. But when you're doing something, let's say for a realtor, you don't want a five or six minute long video about the property they're selling. You want to keep it concise and you want to show off all the highlights of that property. So usually you're going to keep this down to a couple of minutes. Now keep in mind, when we're talking about this simple drone job, 
what's gone on to this so far up to this point where we've gotten to final cut well number one we got the call from the clients we did a little prep work we blocked out the area that would be flying in litchi just to give us some reference points for our video flights we then took the ride down to the location round trip time was a little over an hour so a half an hour each way and then while we were on location we invested about two hours of time there so commute time plus the time on location is coming in at about three hours. After that, getting back here and scrubbing through all the video in Kino did take a fair amount of time. So I will, I'm pulling Kino back up just here for you real quick. And so the quick scrub through is just actually coming right through on Kino, going down to the uh, viewing window and seeing if there's anything interesting in this particular shot. The shot was very slow. And if there is, then block out some areas down here for those sub clips. Now we had one, two, three, four, let's get up to here. We had nine different clips of varying length. We scrubbed through each of those, and then we picked our sub clips that we wanted to bring in to Final Cut. So there was an investment of time there, well over an hour of time going back and forth through all these. Once we finished making all those sub clips, let's call it an hour, we started getting into the actual video editing in the first draft and the second draft. We actually went through three drafts to get it exactly where they wanted and where the labels were. So several more hours of time there. So between scrubbing through things for an hour and probably another three hours of draft setup, moving things around, testing things out and conferring with the clients, you know, three hours of outside time, four to five hours of inside time. And that's also including trying to catch up with the clients in between their customers as well. So a lot of time invested here and the bulk of the time wasn't actually being in the field and actually flying the drone. It was commute time and then post-processing time. And we haven't even started talking about the still images yet. So once we went through and got everything set up, how our clients wanted it, we went down to their final draft version and down on the timeline here, you can see, let's scroll this right on over, that the final video came out at three minutes and 22 seconds. And we didn't have a lot of repetitive stuff. We were showcasing all sorts of different areas. And in addition to that, since we're talking about the simple drone job and other things that go into it, right here, you can see that we actually have some motion text highlighting one of the locations, Squaw Peak. So this motion tracker is actually a plugin for, uh, not for Lightroom, for Final Cut Pro. And I have several plugins for Final Cut Pro. So as we said before, the license for it cost me $300 several years ago, but I've also paid for a lot of plugins over time. And in the end, they're valuable for the type of work that we're doing for our clients. So we have basically a full day worth of work involved in what we'd call a simple thing where we're just doing a little video, we're just doing a little bit of still imaging, but in the end, between commute time, shoot time, post-processing time, we still have a full day of our time involved with this. Don't forget, I also have a visual observer with me who is watching everything when we're on location. So it wasn't three hours of people time, it was six hours of people time being out there and then the edits and everything. So while I worked on the video, Jody was actually working on the 360 aerials. And then we were also doing edits to the final still images that the clients were also using in their marketing materials. So this simple job wasn't so simple after all. So let's talk about that hardware. We had a Mavic 2 Pro. We had a second Mavic 2 Pro with us as a backup. We had six batteries along with us in case we were going to blow through too many batteries. Um, we had the Canon M50 for doing some ground video and some ground shots. And we had the GoPro for filming our, ourselves coming in and out of the property. So on top of that, now we get back to the office. What are we looking at here? We've got a Mac Mini uh, M1 here with a BenQ uh, monitor. And then we have the Final Cut Pro with its license for it. And we have the plugins for it. We also have Kino. And we also have Lightroom for managing our still images. And PT GUI for doing our 360s. 
So in the end, there's a lot of investment in our equipment as well. You don't have to run out and buy the newest equipment today if you're just starting out. First, get those drone basics down, get your flights down, and get your editing down when you return from the field. So photo editing and video editing, while they have some things in common, there's a lot of differences there too. So you might be an expert with still images, but you might be just learning when it comes to putting videos together. So the whole point of this series, and this is the wrap up of this series, is to give you some insight into what you'd think is an easy job. Hey, somebody just called me and they just want me to go fly a couple acres. And I wanted to present you with the reality of the additional cost and additional time that even go into a simple job. By the way, if you head on over to my Teachable site, easy-drone.teachable.com, we do have a class called Post Part 107. And that class actually talks through um, with more specifics and more detail, the cost of the equipment, the cost of the software, and the cost of our time. So as you're considering building your drone business, you'll have some ideas of what types of equipment and software you really truly need beyond just that drone and the controller. So go ahead and check that one out. There are a couple of free previews on that class as well. And we do have a discount code for our YouTube subs and our current students as well. Well, I hope that this three-part series was good for you and gives you a little more insight to a simple job and the extras that go into it and some insights into how much time you're really going to be investing in these projects so that you can also start thinking about your billing and you know what you want to pay yourself per job when it's all said and done. All right, everybody, have an awesome rest of your week. We'll see you again here real soon. For those folks on our Patreon channel, don't forget this upcoming Sunday, we will have a new Zoom meeting at 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. So we'll look forward to seeing you all there. All right, once again, have an awesome week.